I'm excited about that. I hope you guys, I really hope you guys uh, sign up for that. For the chance to come. It's going to be awesome. Um, Jesus is going to return, guys. If you know that or not, he's on the way. Um, last week we talked about the sign in the heavens. And this particular sign, um, as we were reading, I think we uncovered some pretty wonderful things. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. She was pregnant, crying out from birth pains and the agony of giving birth. Another sign appeared in heaven, a great red dragon, with seven heads and ten horns, and on his heads seven diadems. His tail swept a third of the stars of heaven, cast into earth. The dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth. And so, uh, as we went through this, uh, we discovered a few things, right? Uh, from Genesis 3, there's this bloodline of Jesus that passes through the woman and her seed. You will crush his head, his promise, he will strike your heel. And of course, the devil knows every single promise that's in the Word of God, the devil is aware of, and he works really hard to distort it in the minds of those who believe it. We'll get back to that in a minute. She's clothed with the sun, the moon is at her feet, and twelve stars are crowning her head. And there's these key characters in this whole scene. The woman, which is Israel, the male child is Jesus, the great red dragon is Satan, the stars of heaven are his angels. Now, um, prophecy always has a dual fulfillment. So where you see one time it's fulfilled, you know that it's got another fulfillment. We call that a meta fulfillment. Some fulfillment that takes place that is the outside fulfillment of what was immediate. Okay? And so the church... Is the body of Christ, right? So Jesus is obviously the child, right? The child that's born is Jesus. And so Jesus is literally snatched up. He's arpazzo, right? He's raptured from the apostles as they're sitting there standing watching him. He is raptured up and he's taken to the throne of God. But that's not all of Christ, even though that is Christ. He's not, the body is still here, right? And the body is still being born. There's more of us to come. And until the last part, the last member of that body comes, the birth is still yet unfulfilled in some ways. And so, you can't separate the body from the head. Jesus is the head of the body, right? But the church is the body of Christ. These are things that are mysteries that Paul talks about to us that maybe we don't understand completely or fully until we get to passages like this. So the church is the body of Christ, is the meta fulfillment of the child sign in the heavens. In other words, when the child is completely born and the kingdom has arrived, then we will, the body of Christ, the child, Papazzo, raptured up to heaven. And so the complete full body of Christ will be in heaven, seated on the throne of God. That's incredible, right? We are actually in the spirit, seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And so in a wonderful multimedia event, we talked about how this sign in the heavens is actually happening wow, next year, on the 23rd of September 2017, in the constellation Virgo, the sun, she's clothed with the sun, the moon you can see there is at her feet, and you can see a crown of 12 stars at her head. Normally, she's got nine, except there happen to be three wandering stars called planets that make their way, their circuits, through the constellation Leo. And so there's a crown of 12 stars on her head. And looky there, Jupiter happens to be passing through the womb. And then Jupiter actually makes this round for 42 weeks. He's in the womb for 42 weeks, which is the gestation period of a human being. And six times seven, we talked about, is the kind of a multiple, six being the number of man, seven being the number of God. This perfect sign that doesn't get any more clear than that, that Jesus is coming soon. This is the final warning to humanity that is not, this is not barred by any language. The Bible doesn't have to be translated. You can look up at the sky and you can see what's happening here if you're studying the heavens. There is a sign revealing to the entire world that God is getting close to being And so today, I want to talk about war in the heavenly realms. We talked about this great sign, and the thing that happens here is the devil is waiting. He's right there, right? He's waiting for that child to be born because he wants to snatch it up. Because the devil comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. That is his entire mission. 
He's on a suicide mission because the devil knows that his time is short. The devil knows that he is defeated. And so, as a one who is defeated, he is doing all he can to bring everybody with him into destruction. So we have to be extremely careful and wary of him. So Revelation chapter 12, beginning in verse 7. War arose in heaven. Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought back, but he was defeated. See, that's the word of God right there. He was defeated. And so the devil looks at that and he goes, I've got to mess that up as much as possible. I can't let people believe that I'm defeated because if they do, they won't follow me. There was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down. That ancient serpent who was called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world, he was thrown down to the earth and his angels were thrown down with him. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down who accuses them day and night before our God. They have conquered them by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, for they love not their lives, even unto death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to you, O earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath, because he knows that his time is short. And when the dragon saw that he had been thrown down to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. But the woman was given two wings of the great eagle, so that she might fly from the serpent into the wilderness, to the place where she is to be nourished for a time and times and half a time. So, this is going to get awesome in a minute, because I think you're going to see something you may not have seen before. In Daniel chapter 7, Daniel has this vision of four beasts. And the four beasts, again, have an immediate fulfillment. The four beasts here are represented as um, the Babylonian Empire, the Persian Empire, the Greek Empire, and then finally the Roman Empire. So this, as he's looking, these beasts actually refer to those immediate, in that immediate context. However, as you look in this passage, you'll, you'll also see that the final beast is also the time of the end, and the Antichrist comes in the middle of that time period. So you'll have to read Daniel chapter 7 to really get all of that. But, these beasts not only refer to the immediate fulfillment, but they refer to those four kingdoms. They also refer to four, I believe, nations, or four uh, groups of nations that exist in the end times. Okay? So what you're looking at here, I'm going to explain it. I'll explain it. Four great beasts came up out of the sea different from one another. First was like a lion and had eagle's wings. So if you think about that for a second. Then as I looked, its wings were plucked off, and it was lifted up from the ground and made to stand on two feet like a man. And the mind of a man was given to it. Okay? So... Uh, this is my interpretation of this passage of scripture. It could be completely wrong, but I want to submit that, it's, that this is a potential interpretation for it because when we get to Revelation, I think it holds significance. This lion, okay, the, the uh, royal seal for England is the lion, right? And the lion has wings. Two wings are plucked off and made to stand alone as a man. I don't know about you, but I know that our country has the symbol of an eagle, right? It's our symbol. Separate. You see the independence of America, I believe, here in this passage of Scripture. That America is able to stand on two feet like a man. And I don't think that that's just a coincidence. And I also think it has a, lot, a whole lot to do with America. Particularly because if it weren't for America, and it weren't for that split, and it weren't for what happened here, Israel would not even be a nation right now. Okay? So it makes sense to me that the Bible would include us, at least a little bit, in the prophecy of what's to come. Because we, that is a huge role that we play. And I believe something even further. When we look back at, at this, the woman is given two wings of the great eagle. Okay? So she might fly from the serpent into the wilderness. This whole period of time, we're talking about the devil. This war with Michael, the archangel, and Satan has been happening since, well, since the beginning. And this is all, all, all of the, the period of time that we go through when Jesus is born all the way through. The devil and Michael the archangel are the ones that are, that are the opposites, not the devil and Jesus. Does that make sense? Jesus and the devil are not opposites. Jesus is like so far through the roof that I can't even point to that, okay? But Michael and, and the, arch, the archangel Michael and Satan are the ones who are at war with one another. And they're fighting for what I would call the second heaven. 
Okay? The realm that is above this world, that is above the physical realm. It's not, he it's not heaven, the realm of God. It's the realm that all kinds of wonderful, crazy, terrible things happen in the middle. Okay? The serpent pours water like a river out of his mouth after the woman to sweep her away with a flood. But the earth came to the help of the woman. The earth opened its mouth and swallowed the river that the dragon had poured from its mouth. Then the dragon became furious with the woman and went off to make war with the rest of her offspring on those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. And he stood on the sand of the sea. And this is particularly relevant because what's about to come up out of the sea, he's about to bring out another beast that comes up out of the sea. We'll talk about that next week. And I debated on whether I was even going to get into that this week because there's so much to cover there. But I wanted to finish chapter 12 and I want to talk about spiritual warfare. I want to talk about the war that's going on in the heavens because I think, particularly for this nation, we have become lazy, we've become relaxed as a church, we're missing, well, particularly signs in the heavens because our eyes and our heads are down here. We're looking at things that are earthly and not keeping our eyes in heaven, even earthly heaven, sky. So, there's a couple of things I want to mention, and I'm going to post all of these points up. I thought, well, I think I'll have the points that go up. I want you to read all of these, and you can, maybe this Holy Spirit will uh, pinpoint certain things that stick out to you. But I want to talk about this. The earthly and the heavenly realm interact. Okay? So, what happens here is affected by what happens here in the, in the heavenly places. Okay? And vice versa. You may not realize that, but it happens the other way around, too. That what happens on the earth affects that which happens up, up in heaven. Okay? So, they interact with one another. The church is a strategy that Jesus is, has employed. We're not only his children, but you're born into the spirit realm. And so there's something crazy special about the saints. That when we're born again, we're born in the spirit. We're born into that realm. You may not realize that, but you are. And so, Jesus has intended us to become an army that fights in this realm, that affects what happens here. Does that make sense? You're not only just supposed to live, in fact, when you become a believer in Jesus Christ, your life dramatically changes because you're no longer focused on the things that are on this earth anymore. You have new purpose. You have new goals and ambitions, and those include things that are in the heavenly places. And most of us, are almost completely ignorant of what that whole realm is all about. Are we not? Most of us have almost no idea about what demons and angels and fallen angels and all of that nonsense is all about and what goes on and how we can... How do you speak to that? How do you change that? So the satanic strategy that he's employed is to keep your heads down. What Jesus has done in building his church... He's thrown an extra factor into the equation. He's got warriors that are born into the spirit that can change the course of, what's, of this war that's happening between Michael and Satan, between that, that spiritual warfare. So, in other words, the prince, remember in, in Daniel, you talked about the prince of the power of Persia resisted the, uh, the uh, angel Gabriel for three weeks. Three weeks he was at war with the principality and power. It took him three weeks to get the message to Daniel. So we know that this, there are principalities and powers that are over particular nations. Things that happen on the earth affect things that happen in heaven and vice versa. So as we learn what, what that means and how that interacts with us, we can learn that the army that Jesus is building has the potential to change the outcome of things that happen in the, in the spiritual realm. Um, and we're going to get to that a little bit more when we talk about Ephesians chapter 6. That's, that's a really big uh, point there. Our battle is not against flesh and blood. So what the devil has done in America, I think, is to effectively disable the church by keeping our focus on things here. We're sitting, we're scrolling through, we're typing stuff in our, in our computers, we're, we're not dialed in to the spiritual realm, we're focused right here on everything that's happening. We're more focused about things that we're watching on television and the music we're listening to than we are about what's happening in, this, in the supernatural realm. And my friends, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you can't afford, you cannot afford to do that. You're more concerned about, of course, I mean, everybody's happy about what happened last night with Penn 
see, right? That's awesome. That was cool. That was great, right? But sometimes we get more focused on that, don't we? We get more excited about that than we do about the things of God. And my friends, that's idolatry. As great as it is. That was a pretty awesome point. I'm not, not knocking that at all. Okay. Don't stone me. <laughs> but we can't get too focused on those things, can we not? We can't get too narrow-minded. What am I going to do with my life? Or what does God want you to do with your life? Right? The devil knows that if we will fight, we will win. He knows that. The God of peace will soon what? Crush Satan. Crush Satan underneath whose feet? Your feet. The God of peace will soon crush Satan underneath your feet. Right? I've given you power to trample on scorpions, upon serpents, and on all of the power of the enemy. And it shall not harm you. So Satan knows those truths about the church. He knows that that is accurate. That if we're willing to stand up and fight, we will win. And so the satanic strategy for this country, for this world, is let's keep their heads down. Let's keep them focused on the stuff in this world. Let's keep them doing the things that they're used to. Get them locked in. Loop it. Keep it going. And we quickly lose sight. We lose track of the spiritual. He's blinding our hearts. There's this massive spiritual war that's taking place in America that I believe is directly affecting what's going on in heaven. The devil's keeping our focus on earthly things. We need to be looking outside of ourselves. We need to be looking in the lives of other people and speaking life to other people. Like, just pick your head up. Look around. Look around at people. Look, look into people's eyes. My goodness, do you realize how much power your eyes have? When you look into... This is crazy. Have you ever watched a social experiment where people look into, into somebody's eyes? It doesn't take very long for somebody to start weeping. Why is that? Because there's so much power in locking gaze with another person. We don't even do that. And we do it a whole lot less in New York, where I come from, than we do here. I just had a friend of mine went to New York, and he said, people don't even look at you. They just walk right on by. They've got their own agenda, their own mind, their own thing. I, I'm, I work out, well, I haven't worked out a couple weeks, I'm not back. But normally I'll work out, and I go to the gym, and my goodness, everybody's got something to listen to, don't they? Everybody's got those TVs all over. There's something to watch, right? There's almost no opportunity for me to even talk to somebody at the gym when there would be plenty of opportunity to just open conversation because we're all doing something similar. You see how the devil has so snuffed out even worldly community to keep everybody isolated, to make sure you don't have any interaction so there might not be any quite little possibility that you might be able to look into somebody's life and speak life, speak truth. Take, take the darkness and turn it into light. We have to be aware of what we're doing. So many of us parents, I know that I'm, I'm guilty of this as well. Our kids are doing whatever and we're sitting there scrolling, right? You're missing your children's lives, aren't you? You're missing, we have a whole generation of parents who don't even know how to be parents because they're so concerned with, with what everybody else is doing, they don't even know what they're doing in their own life. And I'm telling you this because I believe this is a satanic strategy to keep us from becoming who we are supposed to be, who we are meant to be in Christ. And I hope that it hits you. Let it hit you. Let that, just let that hit you a little bit. Be knocked back by it. Because the, the, the conviction of God, I think, leads us to repentance. Leads us to a great, who He intends us to be, my friends. And it's much greater than the world, than the devil, than all of that has planned. We have not been given a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and of a sound mind. And if the devil can keep us from being effective in the spiritual realm, he's taking out a real factor in his ultimate defeat. He's wanting to delay this as soon as possible. If you knew you were on a crash course, would you not want to delay it as long as possible? He knows it's inevitable. He knows there's a day coming. And he wants to delay it as long as possible because he wants to drag everybody to hell as much as possible. So what does the scripture say? Michael the archangel prevails over the devil. 
So what he does with the Word of God is he knows he's, he's not going to win. He tries to distort it, he tries to manipulate it, he tries to deceive us. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet and give him power over all of the enemy. If we stand up, we will win. If we fight, we will win. That's why I believe there's such heavy spiritual warfare on America today because the devil has heard the word of God spoken over this nation. He knows the prophetic word over America. And so he's working overtime to make sure that doesn't come to pass. Intercession comes before insurrection. Anybody know what an insurrection is? It's an uprising, right? It's a rebellion. And why am I, why am I even saying it? And I say it for positive or negative, I put that up there specifically. Because if you want to, if you want to rebel against the authorities, if you want to, if you want to undo what is the status quo in our country, you are going to have to intercede. You're going to have to become an intercessor. You're going to have to pray. You're going to have to enter that realm in the spirit before you ever get there in the flesh. You understand what I'm saying? If you want to undo what the principalities and the powers of darkness are doing in our country, you're going to have to go there in the spirit. You're going to have to start getting on your knees and praying for your country, praying for your friends and your family, for your communities, for your cities, for Bristol, Kingsport, Johnson City, and all of, the, all of us together. Praying for unity, praying for the saints to come together, praying that we will become more than what we are now so that we can serve the eternal King in this nation again. Because what I believe affects what I do. And if I believe every day that I'm going to sin and there's no hope, that I'm just a sinner and, and, and everything is, I'm going to be a failure and, and so there's no use even trying because I believe there's no hope. Then I'm already defeated. The devil has no, he doesn't even need to worry about me. But if I believe that when I, when I submit to the Holy Spirit that I can stand against the flood of darkness, that I can say no to temptation, that I can rise up, that I can say yes to God, that I can obey. When you believe that simple truth that you can obey, you begin to walk with God differently and it changes your life. That's what repentance is, my friends, is when you agree with God that it's possible to have victory in your life. When you agree with God that you don't have to sit in the slums and be a victim anymore, you can get up and you can walk towards the light, towards freedom. So what I believe affects what I do. If you believe that America is doomed, and it's gone, and it's over, and you believe that to be true, you will not have any effect in its restoration. You won't have any effect in bringing about what God wants to accomplish with this nation to do what's righteous and what's true in the world. If you believe that it's all over, you're thrown in the towel, you say, that's it, forget it. God's abandoned this country, judgment is coming, and it's over then the devil's already won, my friends. What I believe the prophetic word is over America is what I'm reading right here. That those eagle's wings take Israel and rescue her and pull her into the wilderness to be spared of the devil's wrath. And if he knows that this nation can rise again, can put to death the things that, that divide us, the stuff, the petty things, the earthly things, right? We can get our minds focused again that our citizenship is not here permanently. It's in heaven. The devil knows we can become a force to be reckoned with. The church can do incredible things in the power and in the name of Jesus. God has a purpose for this nation, and I believe it's worth praying for. It's worth getting on your knees for. And I specifically believe, even beyond just this nation, I believe this area. This area has a particular part to play in the restoration of this country. There is something special, God. I've, been, I, I've lived in New York. I've, I've, my brother lives in Pennsylvania. I've seen other parts of this country. This is a unique area. And I'm just telling you, if you believed that you could change things, would you not live more righteously? Would you not live more powerfully? Would you not give more of your life away to Him? Believe, my friends, believe that God can do incredible things to those who trust in Him. Speak life into the void. Light and breath. The first word God ever said in creation was, let there be light. 
first thing. And guess what the first thing in the new creation? It's His breath. The Spirit of God, right? We are the first fruits of the new creation. I didn't even be created yet, but guess what? You're the beginning. You are the light of the new world. Of the, I have to say the new world, guess I'm sorry. The new creation, okay? When Jesus comes, when He restores His kingdom, we are the first of that creation. And so we need to take who we are as light and breath and shine in the darkness, speak light into the void. There's all kinds of voids, there's all kinds of darkness all around us, but God has given us power to break the power of sin, to break the power of the enemy. And if, you, if we can get our heads up, we can make eye contact with people, and we can start conversations, and, and you can change the course of somebody's life, one person at a time. And you believe, your overarching belief is that you can make a difference, not only in this area, but in this country. That you're not left with just two options at the end of the day. Because you have a king who sits on the throne, who is in control, who is over all things. And you can trust that in his sovereignty he will accomplish his purposes no matter who sits on the throne of America. Are you hearing what I'm saying? We've been talking about all kinds of information the past several weeks. A lot of things that are probably new to you. Today, my whole purpose has been to talk about something that you can go home with and take practically. There's not a whole lot of information in this. It's mostly just motivation. It's, 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 making, it's making changes so that you, you learn how to be who you were created to be. This Connie came up to me, or I think Taylor, and I heard it through Taylor. She says, you know what, we need more intercessors. We need more people who are willing to get on their knees and pray. Not just for this church, and boy, we sure need that. But we need people to pray, to stand in the gap, to be priests and priestesses of God. We need intercessors who are willing to come into the spirit realm and to take territory so that we can continue to, to go in in the flesh and make a difference for the kingdom of God. You see, if I want Kingsport to know Jesus, then I've got to walk the roads of Kingsport in my mind. I've got to pray through the roads of Kingsport. You hear what I'm saying? We've got to put on the full armor of God. And I figured I'd throw that guy in there because I was like, you know, too often we're like, and have your little soldier with a sword and a shield, you know? And I'm like, you don't realize how flipping awesome you are in, in the spirit realm. How God has made you. He's made you to be this amazing warrior. Girls, you too. He's made you to be an amazing warrior that's, 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 that is able to fight principalities and powers with weapons of righteousness and the word of God. And so we need to meditate and apply Ephesians chapter 6. If you've never done this before, this is practical. I encourage you to do this. You need to go through the armor of God, the sword of the Spirit, the breastplate of righteousness. You've got to put that stuff on. Think about what is that? The sword of the Word of God, the breastplate of righteousness. You've got to put that on in your mind. Just visualize yourself putting this, this armor on, the belt of truth, the boots of readiness. I'm ready for anything. I'm ready to go. I'm ready to go wherever God calls me to go because I have the peace of God that passes all understanding. And there's nothing that can harm me, so I'm going to go in His peace and I'm going to share the gospel. The shield of faith. And this shield, okay, that guy's got an awesome shield, but the shield of faith I think is a bigger shield. It's one of those shields that's like a whole body shield. And you just duck behind it and you're, you're completely protected from any arrow that the enemy tries to fire. And the helmet of salvation, what protects the most precious parts of our body, what think, what, how we think, what motivates us, our will, everything is protected by the salvation that we have in Jesus. And if we can learn how to meditate on this and apply this in the spirit realm, then we'll be fit, we'll be ready to go out into the world. You'll be intercessors in your bedroom, you're going to be ready to go. You can't go. In other words, you can't go where you haven't prepared to go. You're going on a missions trip. You better start praying for the place where you're going. You pray for the people that you're about to interact with. 
Okay? Pray for your places where you work. If you want an opportunity with somebody, you pray for it. You see what I'm saying? In intercession always precedes an insurrection. So if you want to undo what the devil is doing, and believe me, he's got control largely over this world right now. This is his time. And so if you want to upset that, you've got to go in the armor of God. I want us to fulfill that. I want us to fulfill that message. He has to come up here and just play a little bit. I just want let's all I just want us to bow our heads for a moment and I just want us to do this. I want you to meditate here. And I want you to spend some time thinking about well, what does it mean for me to be a warrior? What does it mean for me to be a warrior in the spirit realm? What does it mean for me to take up the full armor of God? Where have I been weak? And ask Jesus to just strengthen us. Let's pray. God, I thank you for this word this morning. For your word over this nation. For your word over this community. This is a special area, God, and I really honestly truly believe that. And these are special people that are sitting here this morning with me. And I want them to know how special they are. I want them to know what you have planned for them. The God who says, I have plans to prosper you and not to harm you. And he has not only plans to prosper and harm you, he has a plan to give you a hope and a future. And he's not only giving you a plan, He's giving you the purpose to give other people the word that God has a plan for them as well. And this morning, if you are just, like God has, God has done something on your heart today. You just, if you, you felt what I'm, what I'm saying is resonating with you. And you want to be an intercessor. I just, right now, I just pray that God opens up your heart 